Hello, welcome to Cadwell Park and welcome to Bike Social. I'm Michael Mann. With me today are two rather fancy motorbikes uh, that are new for 2020. We've got the Honda CBR 1000RRR, also known as the Fireblade. And we've also got the SP version, which is the slightly higher spec version. So it's £20,000 for this one and £23,500 for the other one. The main differences between the two are the SP comes with uh, fully electronic Olin suspension. It also comes with Brembo brakes and a quick shifter as standard. Whereas this model I'm sitting on here has manually adjustable shower forks and it has Nissin brakes. A quick shifter is an option though on this one. Coming up a bit later, we're gonna test it on the dyno and we're also gonna do some road miles on it. We've already ridden it in Qatar at the press launch many months ago. But what I wanna do here is have a little look at the differences between the two. What differences do those brakes and suspension make and I'm not necessarily the man for the job so I've enlisted the help of the current British super stock championship leader Tom Neve. Sounds good that does. Yeah it rolls off the tongue nicely doesn't it, it does, especially yeah. when you're uh, when you're sitting pretty at the top of the leaderboard. Tom you all right? Yeah I'm good thank you yeah. Now you've not ridden these bikes on the road have you or even in track in their current format? Right? I've never ridden a, a road bike a pure road bike in my life so I don't really know what to expect especially from the tyres and, and no tyre warmers but yeah, we're at Caddo Park, so it's my home home track, so there isn't a better place for me to come and have a go. Yeah, so you've done plenty of laps around this place, but, yeah. but really, I, I, you know, I guess what, what I'm going to ask you today is to is to get a feel for both bikes and, and to try the different for, uh, different settings with the electronic stuff on the SP. And often, you know, we'll, we'll have a chat at later on after after a few sessions, and you can have a go on both bikes. I'll have a go on both bikes, and uh, and we'll we'll reconvene. Yeah, looking forward to it. All right, matey, let's go. set the dash up, the engine brake, the power modes and the traction control, anti-wheelie, that sort of thing. With the SP model, you've got the adjustability in all of this, which is an awesome bit of kit. Yeah, here we go, so riding mode. We can go into here, we can change. We've got power, traction control, wheelie, engine brake, and then you've got your track mode, your sport mode, and your rain mode. We run the kit electronic system uh, on our race bikes at BSB, so it's not, it's not, done through this setup it's done we, we do it through the laptop but it's pretty much the same system as as what you can get with it with this model bike plus we have a lot more parameters with the with the kit stuff because obviously racing you, you fine tuning it a lot more but this basically gives you the fundamental changes that we would do over a race weekend so you got your power five being the least power one being maximum power so on track we want that set to one traction we want that off because in that last session going over the mountain and the bike's trying to cut in and out and we just want it to be as smooth as possible. Wheelie, again, want that off for over the mountain. We don't want the bike shutting the, th shutting the throttle as we're going over there. Engine braking. The road bike is actually got so much engine braking, which for a road rider is spot on, but on track, causing too much chat from the rear a minute ago. So I've, I've put that, took that down to as, to as low as I can. Suspension settings. So I've just set my, I'm just having a little bit of a play with this day. I've never used it before, so road bikes are fairly soft on the front suspension, so I've just tightened my front compression up to maximum. Re rebound, I don't really know where to be with that just yet, so I've left that at 50%, and I'm just going to leave the rear as it is for now, just get a bit more get a bit more laps under my belt before we change anything else. Quick shifter. I've took that to hard because it was quite a soft shift a minute ago. It's too much of a cut in between, the, too much of an ignition cut in between gears which un unsettles the bike really, which is nice for if you're cruising around on the road, it's perfect, but on a, on a track you want it to be a real sharp shift, so yeah, change that. 
ABS, yeah, you've got sport mode or track mode, so I presume the track's going to be a little bit less forgiving. Because in that last session, I was hitting the brakes and the ABS was cutting in and giving me a bit of an uneven feel through the front brake levers, hoping that's going to reduce that. And that's it, pretty much. So we'll, we'll try that in the next session and see how we get on. <laughs> Standard model here. You know exactly where the suspension is. Yeah, we haven't got the adjustability, but you know exactly what to expect each time you go out on it. Really rideable and really usable. So, yeah, mega impressed with it. Time into the uh, Bennett's customer track day. We've got a lot of time on track, haven't we? We've done uh, plenty of sessions and spent a bit of time getting used to these bikes. And I'm really, I, I'm, I'm, I'm valuing your opinion. And I think the the, the viewers are going to be valuing your opinion too. The big difference between the two bikes is, is suspension and brakes, and we've been able to play, or you've been able to play with the uh, electronic suspension, perhaps finding out the different settings or what they're used to. But what are your kind of your big your big takeaways from from today? I mean, they both feel very similar similar machines, but I think the beauty of the SP is that you can go into the suspension, and you can set it up to your preference more, as opposed to having to with that with a standard model. It's you've got what you've got with the suspension unless you go and replace it. So for me, I'd, I'd play with the different, um, with tightening it up, making it dead soft, and I've noticed a massive difference, and I really got, got it quite comfortable for, for what I like, really. So, yes, yeah, bang on. So talk through the settings then. Of course, you can, you can preset some of the modes, and you can flick between the modes while you're out there on the circuit, right? Yeah, so I wanted to just to back to back how hard we can make the suspension and how soft we can make it, and also the engine braking and it, there is a massive difference. For, for a road bike, to be able to feel them changes at a, quite a, a slower speed to what I'd go when I'm racing, it, you normally wouldn't really feel that, that comparison, but it was, it was such a big change. So for a road rider, I think it'd be on the road uh, or on track, wet or dry conditions, you can really get it tailored to how you like. Tell me a bit more about the suspension settings on here. What is it that you've changed between them? You've got the choice of compression and rebound on front and back suspension. So, yeah, I just had to play with that just to get the feel nice on the front end. Yeah. It's always a bit of a compromise when you come to a racetrack because you've got hard braking zones and slow braking zones. But I found a real comfortable setting. Yeah, you, you, can, really, you can really taper it to how you want. So when the, by the time you've got to that, that, that optimum setting for you, for what you want out of you know, this particular bike on this particular circuit, you're just going to leave that alone now? You don't start tinkering with it even more? For me, I, I just like to ride it and understand. It's the first time I've ridden on road tyres as well, so for me, once I got the settings fell in near, it was just about seeing how far I could push them tyres, and, it, I mean, and that surprised me in itself. So no, it's just been a real good day today. I uh, had, a, had a good play for all the settings, back to back both the bikes, and. Yeah, I'm really impressed. So we didn't have a lap timer deliberately, A, because you're not allowed, and B, because I didn't want to give you any kind of, uh, like a red rag to a bull, but how, how do you reckon, how much difference do you think there would be between the two, but once you got into your optimum setting? With the stock bike, you know, you know what you've got. You, you can't change the suspension, so what you, that, the feel that you have is, that's what you've got to work, to, yeah. work with. So once I got into a rhythm, it was, I was, it was good, really, but I think when it comes down to that outright, being able to push and have that bit more confidence from the, from the suspension by being able to make it a bit harder where I wanted to. I think this has probably got the, got the edge on it. It's got such versatility, doesn't it, as well? In, exactly, yeah. And, and you, uh, you taught me something I didn't even know, that the quick shifter has its own settings as well. Yeah, that was awesome, because it was, it was set in a soft mode, which for road riders, you want a nice, easy, dead smooth change, which is going to be uh, nice and soft for the gearbox. But then when you come to the race track, you want real strong, positive shifts. So, we don't want to be wasting time down the, down the back straight, so we made it more sensitive and it was, yeah, it was a lot more positive, both down and up the gears. 
a bit different to your super stock bike, but still an incredible machine, isn't it? Yeah, oh, definitely. Um, but it still feels so similar to the bike I raised, like the seating position, handlebar position, the, the feel of the, the chassis underneath, bra under, under braking and everything. It's, it really is really, really similar. I think stick me some SC1s in it, and I don't think we'll be too far away. I think you'd certainly qualify easily, wouldn't yeah, you? Yeah, definitely. Good stuff. Yeah. All right, mate, uh, thank you so much for your time. Thanks no, for, thank you. for joining it's been, us. It's been a quality day. What we're going to do now is we're going to take probably this bike and we're going to put it on the dyno to see what it makes. Honda claims something like 215 and a half brake horsepower at peak power, uh, but we'll put it on the dyno and see how true that is. About 1600 miles on the clock. It's nicely run in. Yeah. That'd that make a bit of a difference, won't it? Yeah, that's true. Rather than, rather than it being brand new. We've had brand new bikes on here which you run in, change the oil, after sort of a few hours, easy you build it up, and then they, they go top back 200 horsepower from pretty much what is a couple of hundred miles on the clock. You get some which don't really loosen up to the 800, 900 miles. And what about any difference with the engine being a little bit warm? You'll always find as the tyre warms up, as the engine warms up, it, 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 the power's all... You, you'll have to really get into a steady rhythm, five or six runs, before you really get like a good average of where it's at. Baffles in. What sort of difference does that make? If it's straight through, it doesn't really tend to make much difference. So this presumably left some kind of soft limiter in sixth, if not fifth, right? Obviously, they have the top speed limiter, which kicks in in sixth, but it also kicks in in fifth as well because of the, the nature so of the fun. gearing, yeah. Perhaps dyno it in fourth gear to get the best reading. Wait, what's your guess? I'd say 199. <laughs> Just shy of 200. Is that what you, that's what you predicted? Yeah. Nothing down low, is it? 199.76. Max torque 78.96. That was an easy reach, wasn't it? 186, the limiter, and fourth. Yeah. Yeah, you can just, in fifth gear, you start to hit the speed limit. <coughs> the speed limit works on throttle, so it starts to shut down the throttle. So instead of it running straight into the hard cut limiter, but, but it shuts and you feel it's slowly slow down and in six gear it's even worse. It comes in a lot earlier. Still a heck of a big bit of equipment, right? Think it'd be easy to manipulate? The limit in fact will be the engine in that you can't you won't be able to give it any more bottom end or, or, or any more mid-range. Obviously they're strangled down the bottom end anyway, and you, you perhaps help things by tuning them in that respect, but you will never be able to get it back up to perhaps what the, the previous model was with the with the bottom end. 199.76 and the claim 214.56. It's not too bad. Torque wise 78.96 versus the claim of 83.35. But uh, yeah, all at the top, which is why you'd think it's so good on a race track. So a shade under 200 brake horsepower, that's fast, it's fast enough. We know that Honda made no secrets that this is a race bike just with some mirrors and some indicators. And we've seen it on track and we've seen it on the dyno, but now we're gonna see what it's like on the road. We, at the press launch over in Qatar back in January, again, it was just all track based. So, uh, so here we are, we've got the stock model, the, I shouldn't call it the stock model, it's the CBR 1000 RRR, and then we've got the SP version. They are social distance. Chad and I are socially distanced. How are you doing? I'm doing well, looking forward to it. It's going to be an interesting day on the road, comparing the semi-active mainly against the standard Showa unit. Um, but also the gains that Honda have done with the power, the aerodynamics, we're not really going to feel at road speed. So it'll be interesting to see what the differences are between the two bikes when we're actually in the real world in these perfect conditions. Look, we've got loads of roads around here which are pretty good. We've got two great weapons 
And um, there's a good opportunity to talk about the electronics, especially with electronic suspension. We've got yeah. brake differences, suspension differences. But actually, interestingly for you, you haven't ridden either of these bikes before, have you? No, no, I've not. I've ridden every incarnation beforehand. And I can remember doing the first Fireblade launches in Qatar when we first went there. But it'd be the first time on these two bikes. Obviously, I've spoken to you about yeah. it. I've got an idea of what to expect. But uh, yeah, interesting. Can't wait to get on the bike. Seeing them in World Supers and in BSB and in Superstock, the power looks incredible. The chassis obviously works because it's working on a racetrack, but how that translates to the real world in the road where we're driving and, and the power on the dyno, incredible. Yeah, fantastic. Good. All right, well, let's, uh, let's not muck about anymore. Jackets on, helmets on. Rock and roll. They sound ace, don't they? Those Acrophobia's Honda exhaust that's standard on these bikes that's from Slovenia. It sounds really good. You go through a village, fourth gear, fifth gear, and, and it's, you wouldn't even know it, it's just silent, you know? And then you just hear that, mm, bop. You can hear it, guys, just bop. Because you can use that first gear, you get that bop. It is I mean, usable first, isn't it? It's not, I mean, we talked about it off camera earlier, it's not as snatchy as some of the older... No, no, no. Because everybody, everybody was saying it's got long, you know, you were saying, long first gear. And generally, if you've got a long first gear, like on, on all the bikes of five years ago, it was so snatchy, it was unusable. And when we was doing, when we was riding then, I was using second and third, because the pace was pretty good. And, and then I didn't want to use first, and then I dropped into first. Yeah at 70 miles an hour and, and you're in first at 70 yeah. going this should go and uh, be awful but it's like just really nice and usable first is long and it is long gear but first is usable where you know five ten years ago if you had a long first gear it wasn't a usable gear because it was too erratic and the connection was vague and, and you'd hit the throttle and it'd be oh. so you've ridden the both bikes now big difference between two clear suspension you've tested it in, in, in all the modes haven't you went through all three of the semi-active modes on this model yeah um, sport track. When you're when you're in the softest mode of this of the semi-active modes, you can feel that there's a lot more travel. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're going over bumps, you can feel the you know the, the rear extends and, and comes back, and, and the travel is a lot more. When you when it's not so bumpy, that's okay. But when you get to the and it is quite bumpy, it doesn't have time because it's got because it's traveling too far. So it goes, I'm down here, I've got to come back up here. I'm down here, I've got to come back here, and you'll get a jolt and you'll come out the seat. So then you flick it into the, the medium, which is sport. Yep. And the, the step is quite a big step from the softest to there. And that's much more composed and more online with the standard model. Yeah. And track mode, the difference between sport and track, it isn't as big a step between the soft. So it's kind of like, we're there, we jump to there, and then this mode is just a little bit more. And on track, when you really get these undulations, you know, you get three or four undulations in, 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 in quick succession, that's a little too much. So instead of, getting jolted on the up, it's now skipping a little bit. It's a little bit nervous. So on the road, that, that mode there in between it is, is perfect. And almost pretty similar to that one. The chassis is so good on both bikes, they turn very quickly. <laughs> they turn so well, don't they? I mean, you've got so much, I, I've got so much faith in the front end. We're taking it relatively steady and we're in jacket and jeans. You know, protective jeans and we've got good quality kit on. And normally when you're riding in jacket and jeans, you don't want to be leaning too much, but you've got so much confidence. You just kind of railing around the corner going, well, I feel confident. That's, and it is exactly where you want it. It's got bags of rah, you know, the character, the noise, the sound. It's usable in the Honda way. It, it is fast, there's no mistake. But here on the road, you don't need 200 horsepower. It's like, it's like there's a voice of reason. And when I say voice of reason, I mean like there's, like there's some kind of animal in a cage that is the voice of reason at the Honda factory. And they've, they've, asked, they've asked this animal, I don't know where I'm going with this. They've asked this animal for every single Honda so far, they've gone, is it mad enough? Is it too mad? They've gone, yes, it's too mad. Don't yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah. And then they go on this, they go, right, you've got the day off.
Chad, we've had a cracking day on these two fire blades. We've swapped about a bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, and well, look, we know for a fact because the results are speaking for themselves already that fresh out the box, and I keep using that expression, um, they're doing well on circuit, aren't they? They're doing well in the in the hands of the of yeah. the racers. Yeah, super yeah, yeah. Stop, super bike, worlds, yeah, and even the endurance championship, they've got podiums and wins already. Yeah. So, you know. And we know and we know from the dyno that it's neon 200 horsepower at the back wheel true there's a lot of a lot of people say and it's and it's an obvious thing to say you know you don't need that much power on the road but you know no, manufacturers you... have got to make super bikes in, in order to compete and, yeah. and and they sell really really impressed um the standard model even though obviously that's got the semi-active all in suspension it's not like they sent the YTS lads to put the suspension on this. It's still really, really, really good suspension. It's well controlled, it's well mannered, it's stable, it's predictable. The fueling on both models is excellent. That first gear is long, but it's, it's a usable gear. So historically, when you had a long first gear, it was just, it was a gear that you had to short shift out of yeah. to get into another gear, where now it's a usable gear because the fueling is so precise. Electronics are really good, they're impressive. Not too intrusive, but if you do go to the extreme edge, they are very intrusive and really hold you back. It's always good to try these things out as well, isn't it? I mean, as soon as you get on a bike, most people are going to find a setting and probably leave it yes. there, aren't they? But it's really, it's a really good, it's a good um, bit of advice is to try it out, isn't it? Go to one extreme, go oh, to the other extreme, and then find something that suits you. 100%, 100%. I mean, if you had that model, you could turn up to a track day, flick it into your sport mode, yeah. have fun all day, and then when you're riding home from Cadwell and you're shattered and you're tired, flick it into the soft mode, flick it into the soft suspension, nice and pliable, nice and soft. Yeah. And you can do it on the fly as well, which makes it yeah, even yeah, more yeah. convenient. Yeah, and then with the standard model, you are gonna to need to tweak it a little bit if you're going to the extremes, because it's designed to work in a parameter. So if you're going to a track, you're gonna to have to tweak it. If you're going touring and you know you've got five, 600 miles of motorway miles with some luggage, then you're gonna wind everything out and open it up. Um, but just because that's got the semi-active suspension, it doesn't mean they went to Tesco's to get the suspension for this. Right. It's really, it's really impressive. Do you think that the, the that Honda came out with the SP model for, for the road riders, for the people who wanted the bling, and they've got the this model, that version, for the racers who just want to be it? Because, you know, if you're, if you're a race team, you're going to buy a Fireblade, you're going to strip out the suspension, you're going to sort your own brakes out, you're going to sort your own quick shifter out. Is that, do you think that's the reason why they did it? It's kind of an argument for both, because if you were a super stock team, you're just going to basically get rid of the standard suspension anyway and replace it with, with race internals. If you're a track day guy, it depends if you're used to doing your own suspension. For me, I can take this bike, get it to a track, dial it into somewhere where I want to be. But if you don't know about suspension and you don't want to get your hands dirty, because when you fit slicks to that model or when you fit race tires at a track, you're going to have to change the suspension and you can just do that with the press of the button. Whether this model, you're going to have to know a little bit more of what you're doing. And vice versa, when it's cold and it's damp and it's wet and you're riding home and you have forgot your waterproofs like we've all done, you can flick that into the soft mode, soften the suspension, where this, you're just going to have to ride it as it is. Tom Neve said uh, at Cadwell the other day when we were there, he said, on that bike, he said, give him a set of race rubber, yeah. he'd qualify easily and yeah. well. I guess it depends on the track, but it seems to have worked at every track so far in BSB. Like when there were guys were at Snetterton in Superstock, coming onto the straight, it seemed to be working extremely well on the straights. And then when they went to Donington, it worked extremely well down Craney Curves. It looked like the guys could put it where they want. We feel that on the road, though, don't we? Because we can feel how good the chassis is. Yeah. It's very easy to turn. You can, you've got a lot of confidence. It's very predictable. It works. It just makes you feel. But it's a strange scenario because, as we said earlier on, you've got 200 horsepower and it's usable 200 horsepower. Yeah. But it, it has got a little bit of a Jacqueline Hyde personality to it because you can ride it through villages and it's really, really quiet and you can ride through at 30 miles an hour in third gear and nobody would know it's a superbike. It's not like screaming. Yeah. And then you knock it back to second or first, even at 70 miles an hour, you come to first, which sounds crazy. And you don't get like smashed in the face by the clocks when you accelerate, it's, it's drivable power. The exhaust changes the character, it turns into this you know, the amp goes round to 11, it plays the electric guitar and it flies. And then you come to the next village and you knock it back to fourth and everything goes calm again. It's a ferocious noise when you're on the pipe, isn't it? It does sound brilliant. So you get to that anywhere between four and a half, five, something like that, thousand RPM that is, and, and there's that valve and it all of a sudden it goes, Whoom! and it's just the most wonderful noise. I mean, standing on the side of the road early and hearing you from a distance come in, <laughs> in the distance, <laughs> 
Yeah, and it was, but it was a beautiful sound. And I think it's, it's not only all about that exhaust, I think it's the induction sound as well, isn't it? You can hear it breathe, you're like, it takes, it takes, it gets its lungs full and then exhales and it fires. But there is, like you said, there is that definite difference in character. There's very two definitive types of character of the engine. There's a, there's, mm. de there's a definite low down and a high up. And if you're, we've seen it, haven't we, already? So if you're pootling along 40 miles an hour, third gear, and you get to that national speed limit sign, and, and you crack the throttle in third, and it's just, it just takes that... Uh, yeah, yeah, it feels like the throttle's on a bit of elastic. You like go, go, are we going? Yeah, we're going. Yeah. You need to come back to second sometimes, which is, you know, an incredible thing to think when you're riding a 200 brake horsepower bike that you've got to come down the gears. Um, but that's what you have to do. And what about comfort? Because it actually, you know, size-wise, it might look like a 600 paps from a, from a distance, but uh, it's, 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 again, for a sports bike, yeah. that's the caveat, there is a bit of room there. I was expecting it to be a lot smaller because every, everybody I spoke to said, oh, it's tiny. I mean, I'm only 5'6", five, 5'7", five, but I found it fine on the motorway. And when you go through villages, you do expect sports bikes to be slightly uncomfortable because if they weren't comfortable, the front end would be over there and they would never steer because, you know, they'd be gold wings. But I don't, and it's not vibey and it, every, the clocks are quite clear. You've got all the information you need, you've got all the trips. The screen isn't too bad either. I thought the screen was fine. I like the cockpit, I like the way it's laid out. I think it's very clean. It looks, it looks well finished. Like the, yeah. quality, the quality of the build is there. You know, you expect that from Honda, but looking from where I am right now, there's very few cables, um, especially on that one, because you've got cables sticking out the top of the fort leg. No, no. But everything's tucked away and it's, all, it's very, very, you know, people have thought about this properly. Yeah, it's subtle. Everything about it is quite subtle. You know, the, the way that they've done the wings, they could have been outlandish yeah. in, in Panagali style and put some huge outlandish wings on it, but they're, they're kind of subtle and designed into the bodywork. As you said, all the wiring, the view from the cockpit, really neat. The way the bodywork fits, everything just fits lovely. You know, normally you get a thousand cc sports bike, and we've done this a long time, and you go, ooh, I'll change this, and it needs this, and I'll get rid of the exhaust and put an exhaust on it, and I'll change the shock, and I don't like this, and I'll get a tail tidy. Where you walk away from this going, well, I don't need an exhaust. I don't really need a bigger screen. I don't really need a tail tidy. It doesn't need any more bling. The only thing, I mean, I personally prefer the standard model over the yeah. semi-active, but I do prefer the Brembo looking brakes and the all-in sporks from a visual point of view. I think that visually is more exciting than the black model. But aside from that, I would, it's a long time since I've rode a bike and gone, I wouldn't do anything with that. That's it. It's good, that. It's good. You've got Brembo's and this Nissan and that. What, what are the differences for you? For me, uh, it's the lever feel. I really prefer the Brembo lever feel and the adjustment on that model. But these brakes actually seem to have more bite. Now, I suspect that that's had a harder life around a track because the Brembo should be slightly stronger. Yeah. So I think those brakes have been cooked. But there is more braking power with less travel on the lever on this model. But I prefer the lever feel mm -hmm. on the Brembo. They're not bad, are they, at all? They're, no, very, no, no. they're both extremely good. It's just about finding. I would really, for the road, we're, we're nitpicking. You know, we're not, we're not doing, you know, you shouldn't be uh, jumping on the brakes. The only slightly uh, grievance is that when the hazard lights come on. You have to pull at a certain pressure, don't you? Which is, again, very, very clear on track almost at every corner and it's much to the annoyance of people that are behind you. But yeah, they flash away. Great safety feature for the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Less so for the track. I'll tell you what I like is the fact that the indicators are in the front yeah, of the yeah. um, mirrors and they're on all the time as opposed to, you know, traditionally they've been off and then they flash. These are on all the time, which I, again, I think is a bit of a safety feature. I noticed it the day uh, I rode or a 60 mile route along a lot of A roads and it was very busy. And there was a lot of those vehicles that were moving over. And I think that's because they see two orange lights coming towards them. Yeah. I also, I like the way the headlights and the tail light have been designed into it. They weren't an afterthought. It looks like it hasn't got a headlight or a tail light. We are waxing lyrical about these bikes. Um, but you've already said, you've already declared you fancy that one over, the, over this. It's probably because I'm Northern and that is <laughs> three and a half thousand pounds more than True. this one. And luckily, arguably, I know what I'm doing with suspension. So I know that if I can go to a racetrack, I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. If I fitted slicks and I was in Spain, I'd know which way to go. And vice versa, if I was riding out with the lads up to Scotland with a wife on the back, I'd know which way to go with the suspension. If you don't know which way you're going with the suspension, then that makes perfect sense. You'd put Mrs. Chad on the back of that? Yeah. Mrs. Chad is very brave. The, the fueling's really smooth. The quick shifter's sweet. Up and down the gearbox. I would uh, have no qualms. She may, but I'd, it'd be fine. It's not that lurchy. Do you know what I mean? Um, but I prefer the looks of that one. I prefer the gold oarlings and I prefer the looks of the Brembo calipers. So I would like 
this bike in those colours, which can happen. With the Brembo lever. Well, I'm sure that can happen as well. What's fascinating is that, you know, we're, as you said, can't speak more volumes for both bikes. And it's really difficult, you know, you're nitpicking to find a fault with either bike. Where historically Honda Fireblades have always been on the sensible balance. This still has a sensible balance, but now it's got a split personality and it does fall into that craziness that the other bikes always fell into. So of all the other uh, litre sports bikes, mm. or above a litre in the Ducati's case and, and Aprilia's case, you have experience with all of them. Is there anything that you think would challenge this on the road? I think BMW's S1000 is, is probably its closest companion. Cruise control, uh, heated grips. Yeah, and, it, and, it, and it's got that drivability. It's a, it's a good road bike. Yeah. I find the, the, the track wheel quite an easy system to work as well. Yeah. I'm not quite, I'm not 100% sold on the switch gear here and the way in which it, it, it works the yeah, instrument yeah, yeah. panel. The Yamaha, I think, has got excellent electronics. You can really, really trim that when you're on track. You know, you've got slide control, engine brake, traction, and the, the electronics are superb on that. And it has that engine noise, but so does this. Yeah. This has got a real distinctive engine noise. Yeah. The Ducati is actually quite a comfortable road bike. It's not as bad as a road bike, the Panigale. But the Panigale, as you know, is quite difficult to ride fast. You know, I can imagine, you know when you get to the sixth session on a track day and you're like going, should I put it in the van? Should I do another session? Every day you're gonna put the Panigale in the van where this you could put it in a softer mode and ride this and you'd be quite happy. The one thing about, I don't like about the BMW, uh, I don't like, yeah, no, I think it's fair to say. I think that they could improve on, and you've, you've, you've touched on it with the R1 and its own engine character. This has got its own engine character yeah. and sound, and you know, it's fairly distinctive. I just find it so that the, the BMW, it's a little bit placid. It's almost, it's almost a bit nondescript. It, it lacks yeah. a bit of uh, soul. Yeah, the originals were really aggressive. The originals definitely had um, soul and aggression and power. But I think it's just that everybody's caught up. You know, when the first S1000R came, it caught everybody with their yeah. pants down. And everybody went, oh, crap. Do you know, we need to find 30 horsepower here. And now everybody's caught up. It's not that, the, it's, not that it's lost any of its rebellion or any of its aggression. It's just that everybody else has caught up. And now everybody's on par. You know, to, to, to go to a Honda dealership, wheel out and have 200 brake horsepower, that's the power that was winning BSB races five seasons ago. And that's standard. You know, with a race exhaust and a few tinkers, you're looking at 210, 215, reasonably easy with normal service intervals. 20,000 pounds, 23 and a half. I think you can pay four grand deposit and it's about 300 quid a month, something like that on PCP, something yeah. like that. Oh, look, it's well worth a test ride, isn't it? Yeah, 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 it's so much worth a test ride, I don't want to give it back. Shake your insides up and yeah, your yeah, eyes yeah. will be on stalks. I had a kind of preconceived idea of what it would be like. You know, I thought, you know, it would be too small, it'd be too powerful, the first gear would be too long, uh, it'd be a bit uncompromising, but it's not. You know, that, that, the first gear was a usable gear because the fueling is so excellent. The power is strong, but it's usable power. And it, the, the ergonomics of it fits me fine. I'm, I'm quite happy to do a couple of hundred miles on this without any, it's, you know, it's comparable to the others. Mm. I mean, it's obviously not great compared to a CB1000, but we're not comparing it, we're not comparing like for like there. Good man. Chad, thanks for your time. No worries. Appreciate your uh, opinion on everything. Thank you for your time as well. Great to have you with us. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe. If you've got any comments, fire them at us. We'll do our best to get back to you as well. Um, thanks very much, and we'll see you again soon.